Well, with uh, me having been your pastor for about the last 18 years, we have passed many milestones in my ministry uh, with you guys together. And today is another one and a new one. <laughs> Time to time, I'm finding that I have to wear reading glasses. Um, and uh, when I came here at 26 years of age, I had 2020 vision. But uh, I, uh, I find that uh, from time to time, I'm needing these. And uh, this morning seems to be one of those times where uh, I may need them a little bit. So uh, now, when I look out at you this way, you're very blurry when I look around. But the word, the print's very clear when I look this way, so I haven't officially been diagnosed with needing these, so I just picked me up one of those cheap pair at uh, the dollar store uh, that helps me read, and uh, and what's funny is, is that uh, now that I use, uh, use the Bible on the iPad, I can actually kind of enlarge it somewhat, and I find that if I, when I read printed, i got to have the extra large version, so uh, I'm not sure which is next, but... Uh, this morning, I want to return us to the book of Galatians, and uh, we're looking again. And you know, I've always, I always wondered why preachers, I've seen them through the years, it drove me crazy, really, and I don't want to do you that way, but preachers would take and put them on for a little while, and then they'd take them off. And I'd always think, why do they do that? Why don't they just leave them on? But I understand now, you can see here, and you can't see here. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I, I see myself doing that, so... Um, I don't know if that's a sign of me getting old or what, but uh, something. But this might take some getting used to to be able to do this. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But um, this morning we're turn, returning to the book of Galatians. And uh, we've been studying together there for uh, a number of weeks. And uh, I was not with you last week. I appreciate uh, Brother Roosevelt always doing such a good job filling in and, and uh, helping. But uh, we're, we're returning back to the book of Galatians. And we are in chapter 5, and I'll get to that in just a second. I want to I want to draw a, a couple of references to help us before we go to the scriptures to, to understand what we're talking about today in this portion of scripture that the Apostle Paul has brought us to. And uh, I want to I want to uh, I want to read to you from the Declaration of Independence. It says, We therefore the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Our existence as a nation goes back to that fateful day of 1776 when 56 brave patriots signed what we know as the Declaration of Independence. And I find it very striking that twice in the closing sentences of this declaration that they make an appeal to God. They refer to him as the supreme judge, and they refer to him and as divine providence. And when we read these stirring words, what it recalls to me is the idea that freedom is never free. That freedom always comes at a cost. And that this nation that we live in and enjoy was founded by men that were willing to, to pledge their lives. They were willing to pledge their fortunes. Uh, they were willing to pledge their sacred honor. And that the, the continuing price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Amen. That you always have to be vigilant. And so what the, the point of this is, is that what is purchased with blood can easily and very quickly be lost through careless disinterest. That which has been purchased by blood can just easily go away if we don't stay vigilant. And that uh, this morning speaks to me in two ways. One, to the scriptures that we're going to read together in just a moment. But it also speaks to me about our nation and our country. 
that we uh, that we have so many folks that have been disinterested for sort of so long as to how we became a free nation and how our freedom was bought and paid for by blood that through that disinterest that it is now slipping away. Those freedoms are eroding and we are slowly and becoming less and less of a free nation. The danger is the same with our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And we will see that from the words of the Apostle Paul this morning. I recently read an article about a man named John Brown. And uh, if you've studied history, you'll know that he was a fiery uh, abolitionist who, uh, who settled up in the, the Lake Placid area. And he was an individual who helped slaves in his day uh, uh, start a new life. And uh, later on, he traveled to Kansas, and he took up arms to ensure that the Kansas Territory would enter the Union as a free state. And uh, he is most remembered for his daring raid on the armory at Harper's Ferry in uh, Virginia, or West Virginia, in, in October of 1859. And it was there that he and a handful of men, including three of his sons, took over the armory. Their intention was to incite an insurrection, and they thought that that would lead to the end of slavery. And eventually, John Brown was taken into custody. He was tried, and he was sentenced to death, and they hung, they hung him. And during his trial, he defended his actions by referring to the words of Jesus in the New Testament when he referred to the, the teaching that Jesus gave on caring for the least of these. And then he said something like this. He says, if it be thought necessary that my blood should be mingled with the blood of millions of those who suffered because of wicked laws, then let it be so. And then he, and, and after he was hanged, and that was on December the 2nd, his body was buried and up in that area. And uh, in his lifetime, and after his death, he, was, he came to be regarded by both the North and the South as a very unstable, fanatic individual. But, the, but from the standpoint of looking back in history, nearly a century and a half later, it's easy to see that he helped light a fuse uh, that led to the war that ultimately and finally freed the slaves. And we know from history that the war was probably coming anyway, but uh, he forced the issue on the American conscience uh, in a way that could not be ignored. And so such a man as this uh, causes us to reflect on, again, that idea that freedom comes at a very high price. He was willing to mingle his blood with those that had suffered and died uh, fighting for freedom. I say all that to say that we have to fight for freedom. We have to fight for freedom as Americans. We have to fight for freedom. We have to fight for the freedom that we have as Christians. Uh, uh, just as a person that develops cancer, uh, fights to be made well, uh, just as an individual that gets deep in debt, fights to become financially free, just as individuals that get addicted to drugs or alcohol or pornography struggles to, to, to get free, uh, uh, sometimes we have to fight to save the things uh, that are most valuable to us. Uh, and so what I, I often come across individuals, and especially in these days as I'm dealing with more and more folks that, that have these addictions and that have these struggles, uh, uh, more and more individuals that are being betrayed by spouses that, that get uh, uh, entangled in things that bind them down. Uh, I've become more and more aware that we have to be vigilant to fight for our freedom. Now, as we, uh, as we uh, think about that, I want you just to remember that freedom doesn't just happen. Now, I preface this text and all of this sermon with that, because we know that our freedom has been bought and paid for by Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. But the Apostle Paul seen a struggle growing on in the churches of Galatia that he was afraid that they, through disinterest or a lack of zeal or a lack of standing firm, would just let that freedom flitter away. And thereby he brings us to this text in Galatians chapter 5. Stand with me if you would for the reading of God's Word. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty 
by which Christ has made us free. Isn't that what I just said? Stand firm in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law have fallen from grace. There's a whole denomination that says you can't fall from grace, but the Bible tells me you can. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who troubled you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one, one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that they, though we seem far removed from this whole idea of being circumcised to be saved, we're still very near and Lord have lots of false doctrines that teach us that we have to earn our salvation through some deed or some work or obeying or some rule. But Lord, this morning we know that the gift of salvation, that it came and was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it comes to us as a gift. And I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to learn the principles that Paul would, Lord, reiterate to these churches. And Lord, let us learn it in this church this morning. And your, Lord, may we glory in the, in the very gift and, and in the very offense of the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, have your way in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We, uh, we, we move now into the third and final section of the book of Galatians. And when we've been studying this together, if you've been here for the whole series, and hopefully you have, we know that chapters 1 and 2 were very personal to the Apostle Paul. And then chapters 3 and 4 were very doctrinal. And now we move into chapters 5 and 6, and they're very practical. And these first 12 to 14 verses of Galatians are somewhat like a lawyer's closing argument, uh, a closing argument that a lawyer would make to a jury. Here, Paul summons all of the, his rhetorical power because he wants to make one final assault on the Judaizers and the false gospel that was being built in these churches around the idea of circumcision. And as he begins to press these individuals for a decision, he begins to use some very strong language. If you look back at verse 12, you can kind of get a, an insight into the depth of Paul's righteous anger against the Judaizers, against the individuals who were attacking and teaching against the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. If you look back there, he says, as for those agitators, he said, I wish that they, this is a different version than the one I, I just uh, read you, but I like it. It says, as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. That's how angry he was at these individuals that were teaching that they needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. Martin Luther paraphrased this it, this way. He said that Paul said, I wish the knife would slip, is what he said. I wish the knife would slip. And so while that kind of sounds, as I said earlier, strange to our ears, uh, uh, the, the words that are given here reveal the crisis that was going on in the churches of Galatia. This was uh, absolutely nothing less than a battle for the heart of these new believers. Uh, their liberty in, in Christ was at stake, uh, and Paul fires back by, by challenging these Galatians. He 
wanted them to make a decision. He wanted them to make a choice for Christ. He wanted them to make a choice for grace and for freedom uh, and for the cross of Christ. And, and so I, I want to I wanna look at just a couple, three things this morning. And uh, the, the first one is this, is that they had some choices to make. And really, we have choices all the time to make, but, but we have choices as well. And the first one that they had to make was they had to choose slavery or freedom. And in Galatians 5.1, again, he said, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He said, Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You see, the most basic choice between slavery and the, the, is between slavery and freedom. And that this verse very clearly teaches us that Christ came to set us free. And it also tells us what we've got to do to maintain that freedom. And it warns us what we must avoid to keep from becoming entangled again. And so the crucial point is that freedom comes at the cost of continual vigilance. Uh, if we would be free from the yoke of slavery, we have got to take our position in Christ every day and stand our ground against anything or anyone who would steal that freedom from us. Uh, and so underlying all this reality is, is that, that grace and works uh, don't mix. That they don't go together. And I've talked about that several weeks and, and don't want to just keep belaboring the point, but I do want us to get it. Either you are being saved wholly by what God did and what He accomplished on the cross uh, and by grace, uh, or, you're being, or you're being saved by something you do, something you accomplish. Uh, and those two things are never mutually exclusive. Uh, the problem is the, the performance-based world that we live in. Uh, there, are, uh, there are preachers and there are churches that try to lay a, a, a burden on people uh, that tell them that, that you have to act a certain way, you have to dress a certain way, you have to keep certain rules uh, in order uh, to be saved. Uh, uh, many times they do it in the sense of, well, you can't be in fellowship with us unless you, you follow this list of order, uh, this list of rules. Uh, but what, mostly, usually what they're saying is, is that we really think that you're less than saved. Uh, you're less than Christian. But the fact of the matter is, uh, is that we're either saved by the, by the way we perform and uh, the way we keep rules, uh, or we're saved by grace through faith uh, in what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. Do you see, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's people want to take it upon themselves, though, uh, to become the judge and the jury. Uh, and so oftentimes people uh, become rejected. And that's what Paul knew would happen with these individuals. These folks that wanted to put ad rules to the Word of God, they wanted to add laws to the Word of God, they wanted to twist the Scriptures, they knew what they really wanted was to be in power over these new believers. They wanted to control them if they could. And so thereby uh, they were rejecting grace and accepting works. Uh, and so many times uh, people are wrote off as unqualified if they don't follow the man-made rules. Uh, while, uh, a while back I read the bio biography of uh, G. Campbell Morgan and he was the great uh, uh, British Bible teacher in past generations. Uh, and one thing I did not know about him is that he had at one time tried to enter the Methodist ministry. He had tried to enter the ministry in the Methodist church. Uh, and even though we know that he went on to worldwide fame, he, uh, he never forgot the sting of rejection. Uh, when uh, he, uh, he cabled his father with the bad news, uh, I like what his father's response back to him was. He told him, he said, rejected on earth, but accepted in heaven. My message is this this morning to you is that you have been made acceptable through Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. That I don't need a, a man's acceptance to be accepted in heaven. That I may face rejection here by people and by individuals and good-meaning people and people that consider themselves to be religious and high and holy, but I have been accepted by God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? 
And so though we may be rejected on earth, we've been accepted in heaven. I don't know about you, but I think that's something to rejoice about. That we've been accepted because of Jesus Christ. How many of you know we've got to be vigilant about that? If my acceptance into heaven is not going to be based on your judgment, and your acceptance into heaven isn't going to be based on my judgment. Our acceptance into heaven is going to be based on whether we've been covered by the blood of the Lamb, whether our names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, uh, whether we by faith have accepted the sacrifice uh, that was made on the cross. But there's always a battle. There's always a, an, ongoing, uh, an ongoing battle uh, uh, for acceptance. Uh, uh, I think that churches are very guilty of this in our day and time. We're always uh, wanting to add rules and regulations to what God has already revealed. And that's nothing new uh, uh, because we know that that's what the Pharisees were doing in their day and time. You know, the story of Morgan reminded me also that that nobody passes through this life, though, without feeling rejection. That we all at times feel the sting of rejection. Uh, standing firm in our freedom uh, allows us to learn from those defeats uh, uh, while not being defeated by them. We're going to all face individuals at times that are going to reject us. It happens, unfortunately, all the time in marriage where one spouse rejects another spouse. Uh, uh, they, uh, a lot of times one spouse will say, well, I, I love you uh, conditionally as long as you meet these certain expectations. Uh, employers do the same thing. Uh, one football coach once uh, said this to a place kicker. He was about to attempt a game-winning field goal, and he turned to his coach and he said, Coach, he said, if I miss this field goal, he said, will you still love me? He said, yes, son. He said, I'll love you, and I'm going to miss you, too. <laughs> so we're always having, we're always facing possible rejections uh, in our life. Uh, and so, but the fact of the matter is, is that we are in Christ. And in Galatians 2.20, he says, Christ now lives in us. That's, that's our assurance uh, that we are the children of God, that our position in God's family is secure, and that we have been set free from the, from the guilt of sin, set free from the power of sin, and that, that someday we'll also be set free from the presence of sin. And so one of the implications of this verse is, is that, that this, and I want you to get this. When Paul gives these verses, what he's saying is this is that it's impossible to become enslaved again unless you allow it to happen voluntarily. You see, that's the problem, is that, that it's impossible to become enslaved by men, enslaved by sin, unless you allow it to happen voluntarily. How many of you know that the reason that our freedoms are eroding and slipping away in America is because we have all been so busy enjoying the benefits of being free that we have just been disinterested in the individuals that we send to, to Congress. And guess what they want to do? They want to do the same thing the Pharisees wanted to do to the church. They want to control you. And so the way they control you is they pass more laws. You can, you can always determine a, a politician but by the laws that he wants to pass. Now, every time somebody slips and falls, will there ought to be a law against that? Every time somebody gets wrong or, or something happens, will there ought to be a law against that? And that's the way the Pharisees did, was that they entangled these individuals. Now listen to me, there's nothing wrong with laws. We all got to have, everybody's got to have boundaries. I mean, even the, even the seas are hemmed in by boundaries. We all have to have boundaries, but there's a difference uh, between the boundaries that God gave and the boundaries that man gives. And so what we find is, is that anytime anybody's wanting to put these conditions, uh, what they're wanting to do is control you. And when they control you, you become a slave to them. They want to enslave you. Satan is the same way. Satan wants to enslave you. And so what he does is, is that he tempts you to, to break the very laws of God. He, he entices you to, to do the very things that he knows will, will cause a, a burden and a yoke to come back on you. Guess what? Satan can't do that without you voluntarily walking into it. 
I want to I want to submit to you that that's what Paul's seen these Galatians doing. That they uh, that they themselves, many of them, were very zealous to to do God's will. Many of them were very zealous to honor God, and so they uh, so they uh, they were they were willing to to listen to these teachers. Uh, the, another thing that that, that that I want to caution you about is is that sometimes we become so disinterested that we're always looking for something new and more exciting. That uh, many times that's why people church hop. They're, they they went to the same church for a while and they do everything the same way and and they, they kind of get bored with it. So they start to look shopping around for something more new and more exciting. They they get bored. Same way with the nation. They they want they want something different. They want something new. But listen to me. The the, the old. The old never gets old. Uh, yes, Paul said, yes, the cross, uh, it, it's an offensive message, uh, but it never gets old. Paul said, yes, uh, it's an offense to those uh, that are perishing. Uh, but listen to me, uh, it's freedom to you and I who have been saved. Amen? Amen. And so uh, the fact of the matter is, is what we need to do is not let ourselves become disinterested. We need to not let ourselves become uh, bored. And then the third thing is this, is that we've got to be real careful about compromise. I want you to I want you to to, to look uh, back at these scriptures with me. And I want to I want to just break them down for just a minute. Go through them real slow with you. In verse 3, Paul says, and to, and to and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. How many of you know when you go to looking for something new, a new teaching, that, that you better that you better be careful that what you think you want, you better be careful because you might get it. The fact of the matter is, as Paul said this, he said, if you're going to keep one part of the law, you're going to have to keep the whole law. That's the problem with going. Now listen to me, I told you, you're, you're born of, it doesn't matter how many different religions you name, you're either born of the free woman or the slave woman, okay? And if you're not born of the free woman, then you're born of the slave woman. The law, trying to be saved by the law, is just like every other religion on the face of the earth. It's slavery. But he says here, he says, you better be careful in this particular instance when you're trying to go back to be saved by the law because you can't just pick and choose. You can't just say, well, you know, I think I'm going to pick up the feast days. And I'm going to start observing them. And I don't want anything to do with the sacrifices, so I'm going to leave them off to the side. And I'll take a little bit of that Levitical priesthood, and, and I'll take a little of the, the diet, but I'm going to leave this off. The fact of the matter is, is that he says this. He says, if you're going to go and do this, and you're going to be circumcised, he said, you now are going to become a debtor to keep it all. He said, now you're going to be a debtor to keep it all. And you know what? We all know that the law came to teach us that we can't do it on our own. We can't keep the law perfectly. And thereby, we can't be saved by the law. Thereby, we are all unrighteous. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul knows it's ridiculous for them to go back into this system to be saved. And so he says here, he says, you have, uh, he says, and I testify that you're a debtor to keep the whole law, and you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now I could preach a whole message right there about falling from grace, and, and I realize that we're highly influenced by the Baptist influence. I realize that there's a, there's a whole denomination out there teaching us that there's no way ever so whatever that you can fall from grace, but right here's one way. Paul said, if you try to go back and be saved a different way, if you try to add something to the cross, you are estranged from Christ and you have fallen from grace. You're estranged from Christ. And so here we find that Paul said, this is a dangerous place to be, to be estranged from Christ. You can't add anything to the finished work of the cross. Here he says this, he says, We through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You know what he's saying? He's saying you're not righteous because of what you do. You're not, many people get to thinking they are righteous because of what they do. Oh, I'm righteous because I pray three times a day. Oh, I'm right. And you know what? That's a good thing. We ought to pray continually. We ought to pray without ceasing, Paul said. Three times a day is not even enough. But he said, many people are, well, I'm righteous because I, I attend church three times a week. Uh, listen to me. It, uh, we, Brother David touched on it this morning. You can be in fellowship with God without going to church, but you can't be in fellowship with other believers. Uh, but if, even if you are in fellowship with other believers, that's not what makes you righteous. 
The fact of the matter is, is that you can give all your money to the church. You can give all your money to the poor. And you ought to give to the church. And you ought to attend church. And you ought to read the Bible. And you ought to pray that those are not the things that make you righteous. You are only righteous when you're covered in the garment that's provided by Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that He made on the cross. Amen. But those high and holy people set themselves up as a judge to judge other people. And it ought not be that way. Here we see that he says that we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. By faith. Say by faith. By faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You know what he's saying? He's saying that the whole deal about circumcision, it, it ain't going to affect you. You can't say somebody's going to go to hell because they're circumcised. Or they're not circumcised. But in this instance, these individuals were picking this to add it to their faith. This was something that they were going to add to their faith, uh, declaring themselves to be righteous. Uh, and he says that there's nothing that works except faith working through love. And he said, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? How many of you know that there's always, the devil's always got somebody that he's trying to, he's trying to hinder? And he's always got, and he's always hindering us by trying to get us to, to, to disobey what we know is truth. He's trying to get us to disobey what we know as the law of God. Always trying to get us to, to cross that line. He said, the persuasion does not come from him who calls you. And now listen to this. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Say that with me. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know what? What that means is this, is if you'll compromise a little bit, you'll compromise a whole lot. The fact of the matter is this, you can judge yourself so that you need not be judged, is what the Bible says. And what that means is, is that if you'll compromise just a little bit in an area of your life, you'll compromise a whole lot on down the road. What we've got to do is we've got to guard ourselves against compromise. A little leaven, it leavens the whole lump. What that means is it'll mess up your whole life. It'll get in there and stir you up. If the devil can trip you up in one little area, you say, oh, this little thing won't matter. This little sin, you know it's breaking the law of God. You know it's displeasing to him. But we say, this one little area, I'll just keep it isolated. But he says here, it'll, it'll mess up the whole lump. It'll mess up your whole life. If you'll compromise, and you know what we do when we realize that we have compromised in some area of our life, what we need to do is we need to put that under the blood. We need to repent of it, turn back from it. And we need to turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, uh, he says, I have confidence though in you, the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through, but through love serve one another. You know what uh, uh, Winston Churchill said? The price of uh, freedom. You know what he said it was? Responsibility. The price of freedom is responsibility. And you know what? That's the same way with you and I. It's the price of the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ is the responsibility that now that we're free to use our liberty in the way in which it was intended, to use it in the way in which it was given, we now have the freedom to serve God rather than the devil. We now have freedom to love our enemies rather than hate them. We have the freedom now to let go of our bitterness rather than let it rot our guts. We have the freedom now to choose uh, uh, to honor God rather than ourselves. We have freedom to do that. Before we didn't, we were, under a, we were under the bondage of sin and guilt. We were under the bondage of shame. All of those things. But now, we've been let free. And so the, so the question is that Paul can get through his mind is that now that you've been set free, why would you go back into bondage? We could ask the same thing in two levels. One is this. Why would you go into a religion that puts rules and regulations upon you as a means of salvation. And hopefully none of you would. But you know what? It's amazing the churches that do that are growing by leaps and bounds. You know why it is? Because we're a performance-based people. We're a performance-based people. We like to say, look what I'm accomplishing. Look what I'm doing. Look at the changes I'm making in my life. 
Look at the distance I'm going. Look how well I'm doing. Look at me. Me, 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 me. I, I, I. But that's contrary to the cross. It says, look at what God is doing through His Son, Jesus Christ. The second thing is, is once we've been set free from the entanglement of sin, why would we ever want to go back into that again? Are you so far removed that you, from, that you have forgotten how the devil deceived you? That you've forgotten the, the turmoil that your life was in? You've forgotten the pain that those things caused you? The embarrassment and the shame? That you would even want to compromise the slightest little bit now that you've been set free from that? Paul can't fathom it. Paul can't, he can't imagine it. He says, why would you do that? Why would you? Paul was being accused himself. He, that the teachers that were there, they were liars. How many of you know they're just like the father of the devil? Jesus said that. He told the Pharisees. He pointed at them. He said, you're just like your father the devil. You're all liars. And Paul says this about the Judaizers. They're going around saying, hey, Paul's teaching this. Paul's teaching circumcision. Paul's observing the feast days to be saved. You know what? I believe Paul did observe the feast days. I believe he had been raised in them. And I believe he knew the, the, what they pointed to in Jesus Christ. And I believe every one of he that he attended, I believe he was there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe he was there telling people, you know what this feast day points towards? Do you know what this feast day means? you know what, what this teaches? How many of you know all of those things point to Jesus Christ? Every one of them. The fulfillment of Christ. And here we find that Paul says, I, and they were lying against him. And Paul said, you know what? He said, he said, he said, if I was still preaching that, he said, then why am I still suffering for preaching the cross? He said, if I'm still preaching that, he said, he said, I could easily start preaching that. And he said, I wouldn't have to go to prison no more. I wouldn't get stoned no more. I wouldn't be left for dead outside the city anymore. I'd just be well accepted and well liked. And the point of this is this, is that the more you cling to the cross, the closer you cling to the fact that it's the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the more you're going to be persecuted for it. The more the devil's going to hunt you down for it. Listen to me. Our enemy hates our God. And because he, the enemy hates our God, the enemy's going to hate you. The world's going to hate you. The Bible teaches that this world, though we all seem to be getting pretty comfortable here, that this world is not our home. That we have another home coming. Amen? Amen. And our home is not in this world. Once we've been saved and we've been set free, we're just passing through. We're going to the promised land. We're going to that, to that place that we like to sing about. We're going to Buda land. Amen? Amen? And it's coming. And Paul says, those are the things he wants the Galatians, the churches in Galatia to hang on to. Those are the things that, that he wants them to do. But here's the last thing this morning. Is that true love expresses itself. True freedom expresses itself in love. True freedom expresses itself in love. He said the whole, he said the whole law is summed up in that one verse that says love your neighbor as yourself. He said the whole law, everything, all everything. He said you, want, you really want to keep the law of God? Start loving your neighbor as yourself. He said now you're free to do that. Now, now you're free because you don't have to be so focused on yourself. You're free to love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Say it with me. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Can I ask you a question? Are you, are you expressing freedom? How many of you know what many times we hark back to the day before I was born? Back in the good old days where neighbors liked each other and took care of one another and looked out for one another and paid attention to each other. But you know what happens? When freedom begins to erode, people begin to focus on themselves. And that's where we're at. We're in a very selfish, self-centered generation. It's why our nation's in the condition it's in. And it's why the church is getting in the condition it's in. Jesus said, you really want to express the freedom that you have in Christ, consider others for yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You're not really walking in freedom that Christ has provided until you've done that. How many of you know the hardest person to get free from sometimes is yourself? That's true. The hardest person to get free from is yourself. It's why marriages don't like it. It's why marriages don't like it. People get, spouses get into it. They get, they get the itis, itis. 
they get focused on themselves. If they consider the spouse as much as they consider themselves, it's why some people don't stay employed. Uh, lots of people that I'm amazed at people who get jobs these days and time, and, and they go in and it's all about them. Well, I want to work these hours, and I want to get paid this much. I don't, you know, yeah, you're the boss, but I didn't get hired to do that, and I want to do this. Well, I say, if you can't hack it, get your jacket. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is is that that is oftentimes why churches don't make it because everybody wants it their way everybody wants it their way they got their idea of, of the way it ought to be and their personal preferences and they want to express it on everybody else and if you're going to be a part of this church, if you're going to consider yourself saved, and you're going to have to do this, do that. Love your neighbors yourself. Let's point people to the cross. Finish work with Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's stand firm in the freedom that we've been given. And let's not become entangled in bondage again to a yoke of slavery. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. The wonderful gift that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the love with which you've loved us with. And we pray that we go from this place. That you'd help us, Lord, to consider others and love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, we pray that you forgive us where we have at times compromised, even in the smallest of things. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us. Help us, Lord, to be wise and to be vigilant, to stand against. Lord, those that are trying to provide a different way or means of salvation. Lord, we know that you have graced us, that you've loved us, and Lord, that we are blessed and highly favored. Lord, we give you the praise this morning. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen.